This is a deep study on Exodus 2012. Who is mother and father in regards to reading honor thy mother and thy father? So we'll take a look and read Exodus 2012. If you would pull out your Bibles with me so we can go through all this detailed together. Exodus 2012 reads, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now this is one of the Ten Commandments, and it's referenced in the New Testament scripture as well. And unfortunately, no church today seems to teach who the father and who the mother is. And it is constantly repeated in several commentaries that this is our biological parents. So we need to figure out who mother is. Father is a little easier because we refer to God as our father. But who is our mother, scripturally speaking? And why are so many teachers of the word not giving the scriptures enough study to understand that it cannot possibly mean our biological mother and father? So let's begin. Contrary to Western cultures and their beliefs, mainly speaking about America, a word's definition does not always mean looking in the dictionary. A word truly gets its meaning through a culture and the customs of a particular people. This is how words truly get their meaning and their definition. Therefore, meanings behind words change. So we need to figure out how these terms were defined in biblical times. Were they defined as we define them today, mother and father being our biological parents? Or were they used in a wider sense, in a different sense, just as many other words in the Bible were used during ancient Near East times? Now, there are several usages for the word mother. Of course, the number one thing that this could mean is that a woman who gives birth to you physically or a non-biological woman who takes care of a child's needs, maybe by adoption, etc. But also, mother is used in reference to a capital city. We'll take a look at that in a minute. It is referenced as an instructor in many books of the Proverbs. We'll take a look at that later in this video. Those who do the will of the Father, we're going to take a look at that. Heavenly Jerusalem and the church. We're going to take a look at those scriptures and of course denotes character rather than bloodline. So it doesn't always mean something biological in the Bible. It can mean several different things. So let's look at all these contexts. Let's look at the context that denotes character rather than bloodline. If you would flip over to John chapter 8 and we're going to start in verse 40. And it says, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. They're explaining that they are legitimate children, they are the bloodline of Abraham. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So Jesus is telling them that even though you are from the physical seed of Abraham, as they proclaim, that doesn't mean that God is your father. Because the deeds and the actions, the character that they have is of their father, the devil who speaketh of his own. Pay attention to the areas that I underlined. He speaketh of his own, meaning his self, his own authority. I want you to keep that in mind for further down this video. And we move on to this context, that whoever holds the character of God, who emulates Christ, those are the brother, sister, and family. Flip over to Mark chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 31, where it says, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And this is his physical mother and his physical brother. 
And he said and answered them, saying, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he looked around about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, meaning these people who are listening to him, listening to Jesus. And he says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So here's another verse that denotes it's not a physical seed. It's not a physical birth. It is that of character, of spirituality. And we are born into a spiritual family. Remember, in Ephesians 1.5, it says, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. We are adopted into the family the spiritual kingdom of Christ, the spiritual family of Christ. Therefore, when we are birthed into our new creature, our family also changes. Everything changes, and it's spiritual. So let's continue. Something else I wanted to note is that mother in scripture was referenced as a city, a capital city or a big city. In Revelation 17 5 if you want to flip over there and make a note it says upon her forehead was a name written mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth now in ancient Greece the metropolis referring to a mother city um, comes from Mether which is mother and polis city metropolis Now, in the Strong Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature, it says that the word mother was also like father, brother, sister, employed by the Hebrews in a wider sense than it is usual with us in Western civilization. Or it was referred to a female ancestor. All of this is important, so make sure you're keeping close attention to these highlighted words. They'll all come together. In Hebrew, as in English, a nation was considered a mother, an individual, and the individuals, the population of that nation, were the children. And aren't we spiritual children of God's spiritual kingdom? It's something to think about. But I want to go back to Babylon, the mother of harlots, and talk about her as the mother of harlots. We need to examine her because if that is the mother of harlots, then we have a mother. But we need to break down who the mother of harlots is. Now, if Babylon is the mother of harlots, this means that this doctrine is contrary to the doctrine of God and is founded on self. How do we know that? We know that because in Genesis 11:4 it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The phrase, let us make us a name, means let us establish our own authority, an authority that is self-dependent rather than God-dependent, and make us our own authority. Let's go against God's authority. This is the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. Let's eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not the tree of life. And we're going to touch on that subject very shortly here in this video. The mother of harlots is those who fulfill their belly, the mother of the children who fulfill their belly, which was an Epicurean term essentially equivalent to the famous words of Anton LaVey and Aleister Crowley of do what thou wilt, do what makes you happy, live your best life. And it says here in Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So the mother of harlots are those who go contrary to the doctrine of God, who are self-dependent rather than God-dependent, who mind earthly things, who fulfill their belly, and also she is the strange woman, which is a metaphor for the opposing instruction, the opposing wisdom mentioned in the Proverbs. And we're going to get into that in a minute. So who is the strange woman, the mother of harlots? What characteristics? Are resembled here. Well, it says in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 15 through 19, whose ways are crooked. And remember, gods are straight, they're narrow, the straight way. And they froward in their paths to deliver thee from this strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. 
which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take thy hold of the paths of life. So the strange woman deceives people through flattering words rather than employing words, meaning the truth, that sometimes always doesn't feel comfortable, does not follow the covenant of God. All her paths lead to death rather than life. And those who follow her way will never take hold of life. Now remember back in the promise, the days will be long upon the land that expresses life. So this can't be our mother. In Proverbs 7, we, we can read, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. That's interesting. So God's wisdom is a kinswoman, family, mother, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. There it is again. Deceitful words, lies about the truth, ones that make you feel good, that fulfill the belly. Basically, almost every contrary doctrine there is preached in the churches today. Verse 6, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. So clearly this is someone who doesn't have any knowledge about God. Therefore, he's unprotected. Therefore, he's susceptible to lies about God, worshiping another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Verse 8, passing through a street near her corner, and he went way to, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day I have paid my vows. Therefore come I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straight away, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasseth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thy heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Now, this said so much, and it was all idiomatic language about those who don't know the word of God, who don't have the knowledge of him, the fear of him, are susceptible to the way of death, which is the exact opposite of having the knowledge and wisdom of God, which is explained in the earlier chapters before Proverbs 7. What's interesting is in the commentaries, they all try to say, the commentators, that this is about a literal prostitute and beware of sexual immorality and don't fall for a prostitute. And it's, it's so wrong. It is so wrong. So I took some notes in my Bible and I actually took a picture to share some of the notes with you guys, but in Leviticus 26, actually there's several references that going to mediums or necromancers or other gods is considered prostituting oneself. It's not literally warning young boys to not go after a prostitute. That's not what's happening here. And above here it says, stay in context, many commentaries forget that wisdom is a kinswoman or sister, etc. Therefore, lack of wisdom or folly is a strange woman. This isn't speaking about a literal woman seducing a single man. The young man who is without wisdom falls for fair words, lies, and subtlety, just like the serpent. It is always coming from someone unexpected. The strange woman wasn't a prostitute, rather, she was a married woman, and her husband was gone for the time, encouraging the young fool that it was safe. So, 
that it that in itself negates the commentators references of this being a physical prostitute i mean it's comical to me i wrote up here in this corner where this verse is implying that she isn't a prostitute where it says the good man is not home um, something obviously bad but an unsuspecting wife there's a very big difference here lies always contain a bit of truth lies are extremely deceitful so it's it's saying that you know an open prostitute obviously that's bad everyone knows it's bad but an unsuspecting wife well there's sneakiness there there's deception i wrote down here the hearing isn't the sin the speech isn't the sin the words you can even take in are not the sin the sin is the lack of knowledge of god hosea 4 6 knowing to do good and doing it not james 4 17. The strange woman moves covertly and speaks beautiful lies. Wisdom speaks bold truth with authority and lives publicly. This is something you always need to remember. So the Proverbs, again, is not speaking about a literal prostitute. The book of Proverbs, all the chapters in it, would not waste so much time talking about a simple prostitute. It is much bigger than that. So if that is the strange woman, then what's the kinswoman? It's God's divine wisdom, heavenly Jerusalem, the church or the believers of Christ, the path to life, understanding, and therefore the tree of life. We're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden here in a minute. So we can see, compare and contrast that there's two mothers, there's two ways, there's only two religions, God or not God. Everything else is a perverted version of scripture. And now that we know who isn't our mother, we need to discover who is our mother. So reverting back to some of the texts we just read, we can see that wisdom and understanding is personified as a woman, not the strange woman. It has to be a different kinswoman. Could it be our mother? Well, let's dive in and see. In the first chapter of Proverbs, it says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 1.8. So it's already establishing what we're talking about here and how we're personifying these things. So over, if you continue to read and get to Proverbs chapter three, we're gonna start in verse 13. It says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Now the words highlighted in, in green go to every other word that's highlighted in green. So for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the grain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. Well, who is she? It's wisdom and understanding. Anytime there is a pronoun, she, her, him, his, there's always, always an antecedent, which is what the pronoun is referring to. So she is wisdom and understanding. She, wisdom and understanding, is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou can desire are not to be compared unto her. Now, a lot of women try to put this verse on t-shirts and make it about them. It's not about you. It's about wisdom and understanding of God. Length of days is in her right hand. Doesn't that seem familiar to you? Because that's exactly what is said in Exodus 20, 12. Interesting. And in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways, wisdom and understanding of God, are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. There's a tree reference again. To them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth by understanding hath he established the heavens. So wisdom and understanding is a her, a kinswoman, a she, a mother, forsake not the law of the mother. Length of days is in her right hand, Exodus 20, 12. There's a repetitive uh, clause right here. And she is a tree of life, not a tree of death, you know, contrary to the strange woman, the mother of harlots, the opposing tree. So then that means that the opposing tree would be the tree of knowledge of good and evil, correct? Now, mother was always an instructor. And we know this because men would have to be very careful, and this is still true today, who they would marry simply because the woman that you married would teach the children. The children would teach the children, would teach the children. And if the woman was pagan, she would teach the children pagan gods. And this is exactly what happened when Solomon married strange wives. 
We see that in Nehemiah 13, 26 through 27. When he married strange wives, there's that word again, strange. He's saying that he married pagan women. He had so many pagan women around that the national religion of Israel became a sun and tree worship. And that says a lot. Now over here in Proverbs 3, 1 through 2, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So there it is again. We see it there again. The same thing written in Exodus 20, 12. His commandments. Length of days and long life added to thee. Then we see that in Proverbs 13, what we just read. Length of days in her right hand. So there's a connection here. The law of thy mother, which we just read in Proverbs 1.8. The commandments are the law. Length of days are added to, to you, meaning eternal life, for keeping them. Do, are, we start, are we starting to see the connection? Mother is an instructor. Doctrine is instruction. And it's the word of God, the doctrine of God, that is our mother. It's biblical algebra. Each one equals the same thing. So let's continue. So our mother is the path to life rather than the path to death. The strange woman, all the roads led to death. Slain by, many strong men were slain by her and her to flattering words. So in Proverbs 4, 13, we read, we read, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go, meaning God's instruction. Keep her for she is thy life. In Proverbs eleven thirty, it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. In Proverbs 15:4, it says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. In Proverbs 3:18, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. So our mother is the tree of life. All the way back in the garden, she was our mother. So let's do a little bit digging about trees in the Garden of Eden. So therefore, there must be an opposing tree, which we all know is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is how sin came into this world. They ate of the tree that wasn't in the boundary line, God's boundary line. It's the antithesis. Okay, we compare them. We just read Proverbs uh, 3.18, 11.30, and 15 and 4 to discuss that the law, the instruction of the mother, God's commandments, brought you life, eternal life. It brought that connection with the divine. So the tree of knowledge must be the opposite of this, right? So let's read some of the verses about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of knowledge of good and evil will start in Genesis 2, 9, and it says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then in verse 17, it reads, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day... That thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And in Genesis 3, starting in 22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, there's, there's that long days, long days upon the land, long life upon the land, eternal life. We see that reference again right here at the end of verse 22. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, kicked him out, kicked him out with his fellowship with God to till ground from whence he was taken. So just like we were comparing the two women or the two mothers, the mother of harlots and our mother, the kinswoman, God's wisdom and understanding his law and comparing the strange woman with the kinswoman, we're comparing the antithesis of the trees. We can eat from the tree of life or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So I want to dig a little bit more on trees because ironically, it's the first things mentioned in the Bible that often go surpassed. But the first things are laying out a very clear foundation that connects to everything else in the Bible. And I do think it gets very surpassed and overlooked. So let's dig into this a little more thoroughly. Now in the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature, we compare and contrast the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life in the midst of the garden was provided by infinite wisdom. Remember what we read in the Proverbs about wisdom. It's our mother, it's a kinswoman. 
as the appointed antidote of disease or decay of the body, while at the same time the enjoyment of spiritual life or the indwelling of the Spirit of God and the right of access to the tree of life, thus securing immortality, which goes back to Exodus 20, 12, prolonging the days of life, eternal life, the promise that goes with that commandment that Paul says, the first commandment with the promise. We conditioned on our first parents Keyword, first parents not eating the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge. The various references to the tree of life evidently consider it to have been the divinely appointed medium for securing the immortality of our first parents. So we can see that it's connected here, can we not? And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, where it's highlighted here, God would try and prove the faithfulness and obedience of our first parents. You see the word parents there? When through the instigation of the tempter, the first human pair disregarded the command of their creator and partook of the fruit of the prohibited tree, they lost the indwelling of the Spirit of God, equivalent to the strange woman. All her ways are towards death and forfeited the right of access to the tree of life and all the tree of life's ways are towards life. That's what it says in the Proverbs as well. They were now dead in the eye of the divine law, hence their expulsion from Eden and removal from the tree of life. So it's very interesting how all of this is connecting together, and I hope you guys are seeing this with me. I also found a very good book called Sacred Trees by Nathaniel Altman, and it's all about trees because we know from reading scripture that trees were an object of worship among the pagans. Trees were a god to the pagans, various amounts of trees. And we see how they get that by twisting the scripture, of course. We understand how that came about, but it's wrong, obviously, to worship a tree. We don't worship the tree, we worship God. But ironically, many pagans worship trees. And they also call trees and nature Mother Earth. So we see that connection as well. So over here, I took out some excerpts of this book that I thought was interesting to this study. And it said, because the world tree was often depicted as producing fruits that the gods ate in order to ensure immortality, there it ties along with Exodus 20, 12, ensuring the long days upon the land, the symbol of the tree of life was derived from it, the symbol of divine and human unity, and it represented fertility and sexuality, which were big things of worship among the pagans, and was a personification of the mother goddess, which was also a very big thing to have in any pagan religion. You had the mother god, father god, and the sun god reborn, which again, of course, is a distortion of the Bible. It also said in Polynesian mythology, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge was represented as one, but one side was green and one side was dead. One led to life and one did not lead to life. So it's very interesting because although it's pagan, they understand the concepts of it and the biblical concepts of it. And that's always very interesting to me because, again, every lie, it, it looks like it matches up with the Bible because every lie has a bit of truth in it. But this, is, of course, is not something that we believe as believers, but it's interesting to note that it still kind of ties into Scripture and what Scripture says. It's just a twisted version of it. It also says, with happiness and immortality, the tree of knowledge represents forbidden wisdom. So it's folly and ignorance. Remember the strange woman that was mentioned in the Proverbs. If you don't know God, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge of God. Then you have a different type of wisdom. You have folly and ignorance, which of course isn't wisdom at all. But again, wisdom of God is not the wisdom of the world. So what we as believers think and how we are wise and understanding towards things, it's not considered wise to the world. It's quite opposite. And it says that in the Corinthians. Um, I've talked about that before. So next to Polynesian, we have the early Babylonians. And we already talked about Babylon, the mother of harlots. Uh, Genesis 11 and 4, but the early Babylonians called the tree of knowledge the tree of truth. This is what they believed was tree of truth, which is ironic because they were founded on self. Their doctrine, what they, they thought and what they wanted and what they considered good, 
was the knowledge of truth. And it was said that this tree, along with the tree of life, guarded the eastern entrance to heaven as well. Now, I included this. I just thought it was interesting. Um, but basically, it said that trees were the earliest providers of fruits, leaves, nuts, essential for human survival, and that every single cell in our body is connected in some way to trees. So it reverts back to parents. Um, the instinctual understanding of our dependency on trees for survival may have led many earth-centered cultures to believe that trees are our parents and that they have been closely linked to human destiny since the dawning of our existence. That piqued my interest because there are verses in the New Testament that say disobey parents or obey parents, and I knew that it could not mean our biological parents. It simply couldn't. So one more page turn, and then I read this out of the book where it says that although most modern humans take trees for granted, our ancestors recognize them as a type of older relative, meaning parents. So I thought that was also very interesting when we're going back and studying the trees and the way things were perceived in that culture and time and how things were either taken out of context, perverse and twisted into different religions or what they meant biblically or for the culture and the people of that time. So it led me to dig even further. When I was studying this verse, children, obey your parents in the Lord, which is substantial to say, yet every commentator tries to say that it is your biological parents. Well, there's problems with that philosophy because some people don't have parents, some people's parents are dead, some people have abusive parents, non-believing parents, etc. Children, we're known as children, God's children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. There we go. We see it again, repeated in Exodus 20, 12. Clearly, this is not speaking of our parents biologically. This is speaking of our parents in the Lord, in our spiritual family. Yet every commentator and preacher in the church tries to say this to or about biological parents. And it just can't mean that. There's too many problems when you read scripture with this way. So... Let me dig even further. When we go into Galatians chapter 4, starting in 22, we read, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, he's referring to Hagar, and the other by a free woman, referring to Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman, who was Ishmael, was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman who was by promise, and the free woman was Isaac. Born of the free woman was Isaac. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So Hagar represents the old covenant, which symbolizes human efforts. So this includes all rituals or taking things literally, um, sacrifices, obeying the letter of the law. But Sarah represents the new covenant, the covenant that we are in, which is based on the faith of Jesus Christ alone. And Paul says, Hagar, who is called Mount Sinai, now answers to Jerusalem, which is in bondage with her children. So in verse 26, it says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Let that sink in right there, for it is written, rejoice. Thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Believers are children of hev heavenly Jerusalem, the mother city of heaven. So what does Jerusalem, which is above, really mean? It means spiritual Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, where believers reside. It's no longer literal Jerusalem. There's so many people who try to pick and choose what to take literal and what to not. We are spiritual now. 
This is a new covenant, okay? So Jerusalem is heavenly Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. So let's dig even deeper and go to Hebrews 12. We'll start in verse 18. It says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they that could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. For ye are not come, it's speaking of the old covenant where God called out the people of Israel, which was his church, out of Egypt, a type of world and sin, and taught them in the physical wilderness. But it says here, at Mount Sinai is where God revealed the Ten Commandments to Israel. This is also where he proposed the old marriage covenant involving human efforts and literal rituals, which of course are no more, as we read in verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirit of the just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And down in verse 27, it says, And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, because we are the church. Everything is spiritual. Heavenly Jerusalem is spiritual. There's no more physical rituals. We have now come unto the city of the living God, a new covenant. So let's put it all together. Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. It says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. So collectively, the brethren compose Christ's body, which is the church. And we can find that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 through 14. We can find that in the 18th verse of the first chapter of Colossians. We can find it in the first book of Ephesians, verses 20 through to 23. And when we add together Hebrews 12, what we just read, 22 through 23 in Galatians 4, 26, it reveals that Jerusalem above, heavenly Jerusalem, is God's church, which is our mother. But what's even scarier is look how dangerous this false doctrine is and how widespread it is. This truth was not easy to come by. Absolutely not. And all the commentators get it incorrectly in regards to verses in the New Testament regarding honoring parents and obeying parents and disobeying parents and the commandment that says honor thy father and their mother honor thy father and their mother problems occur with the popular belief that mother and father are a biological parents because number one what if you do not have a mommy or daddy are you doomed for hell and number two what if mommy and daddy are terrible people drug addicts abusers convicts unbelievers what if they're dead and what happens when you are an adult child why would paul speak to adults as if they were children the answer to all of these questions is that mother and father and parents in certain contexts of scripture do not mean mommy and daddy. This falsity has spread like wildfire among the churches. And now that your eyes have been opened to the truth, you can go back and read commentaries on these certain verses regarding parents and honor mother and father and see what they say. And it simply cannot make sense. It simply cannot make sense and it can't coincide with everything else in scripture. And it's dangerous because people read commentary sometimes and, and think of it as law. And these are written by men too. You have to look and, and detail scripture with scripture. So let's connect the dots. Why is this important even? Why does this matter? Well, a mother protects, feeds, and nurtures her children. So how does this happen when our mother is the church? Well, knowing the word of God, we therefore are protected from false doctrines. We are fed the truth and we are nurtured through Christian fellowship with the church for reproof and instruction. So imagine if you didn't honor this. Imagine if your son or daughter walks home from school and instead of taking, and instead of walking into your house, 
they walk into a stranger's house, and this is a strange woman reference, and allows them to feed, nurture, and protect. How absurd. The stranger will feed them unhealthy food, which is lies, neglect, and not protect. So we can't, we have to be aware of this. We can't go to the strange woman's house. We have to go back to our mother's house. So simply put, in conclusion of this study, honor thy father, God, and honor thy mother, which is the church, that the days may be long upon the land that your Lord God giveth thee. You therefore are granted eternal life. And this, my friends, is what this commandment means. And I pray that this was beneficial to you. I encourage you to share it with any and everyone. And I hope that you leave a comment down below on what you think. And now that your eyes are open to the truth, I encourage you to go look at some commentaries on how people try to justify this being mommy and daddy and how it simply will not work out. So I hope this truth really brings peace to your heart and I hope you spread it with everyone. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Mary Obasi.